Curator at opensource.org. Sorry, opensource.com. Can I just introduce myself? No. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Uh, she's also a core contributor to the Geek Mom blog. Uh, you guys should check that out, uh, where she covers the adventures of motherhood alongside technology and sci-fi. Uh, she's also a frequent attendee of many conventions where she makes and dresses in various crazy costumes. Crazy? All crazy? Really? They're pretty Perfectly crazy. Perfectly reasonable, They're I think. pretty crazy. Soundwave. Come on. That was that was, a, oh, it was awesome. awesome. It was awesome, but it was a crazy costume. It is powered by a Raspberry Pi and play video. You can play video games on my chest. Is that crazy? No. That is perfectly reasonable. I'm not going there. <laughs> All right. So enough of me. Ruth is going to talk to us about uh, Makers, the next frontier for open source. Thanks. <laughs> it's good to know that this trick still works on Sunday morning. Does it work for me? I like that. That's a neat trick, Gareth. Thanks. So as Gareth mentioned, uh, I work for Red Hat. I've been there almost eight years. Uh, I work more or less near the headquarters in Raleigh, except I don't actually go to the office that much. I started on the brand team and now work in open source and standards. But that work is only tangentially related to makers. So perhaps you have asked yourself, outside of the Soundwave costume, which I didn't expect to come up so early this morning, exactly why am I standing here? Uh, as he mentioned, I am the co-author of Raspberry Pi Hacks, and Tom and I will be doing a signing after this in the O'Reilly booth if you would like to come obtain a copy uh, or stand in line and hope to obtain a copy, I, I, I hope. Uh, I, I wrote more prolifically for opensource.com several years ago when many of you met me, and uh, less so now, and as he mentioned, also for um, an editor for geekmom.com. Uh, but most importantly, most relevantly, I am a maker of things. My first instinct when I see something is, how can I make that thing? Can I sew it or sculpt it or bake it or frost it or solder it or glue something on it or set it on fire and somehow improve it in the process? Maybe Dremel something, rivet it, I don't know. And if I don't know how to make it, I'll figure it out eventually and possibly injure myself in the process, but so far not permanently. Many of you are also makers. In fact, all of you are also makers of things, perhaps less of dremeling and setting fire to the things, but more makers of software, of code, of data centers and cloudy things, and makers of magic when it's Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock and somebody's crap is broken and you don't really know why, but you're going to figure out why and you're going to make it better, and that makes you a maker. And most importantly, you are all makers of open source. So you already understand what that means. What I want to show you is how the makers of tangible things, of the open hardware and the open furniture and the biohackers and the makers of things that we can't even fathom yet because they don't even exist yet, much like all of this five or ten years ago, how all of that came into being and why the movement is so popular right now and why you should all be involved in it. And I hope by the end I will have compelled you to all become involved in it and be part of these maker communities, get out beyond the, the warm and comforting glow of your screens and your GitHub accounts because you are the ones who already understand open source and how you can lead in these new communities. They all face a different set of challenges from what we know in open source software communities, but not so different that they're insurmountable challenges. They do have new sets of legal issues, uh, and communities that are unfamiliar with how open source projects work kind of panic sometimes when the things they make get duplicated. They have different project management and build issues from software when it's pieces and parts instead of bits and bytes. And sometimes makers are a little afraid of how you make money if you're giving your stuff to other people, but we in this room, how many, raise your hand if you get paid to work on this free stuff. Yeah, the first billion dollar open source company writes my paycheck, so I think that's kind of working out. <laughs> but I'm getting the cart a little ahead of the horse now, so let's back up, talk about how this whole maker madness movement sprung into being because it didn't just spring forth from a primordial ooze of hot glue and liquid solder one day and talk about how this actually goes back deeper in human history. Where did the makers come from? So let's start with defining what a maker is. I have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with this word. I love it because it's so perfectly descriptive. A maker is a person who makes things. That is simply what it is. The problem is, at this point in the history of the word, it makes you think of a magazine or a pile of parts and things that blink, because everything should blink, I understand, or a 3D printer. <laughs> yes, everything should blink. Yay! Okay. <laughs> Does anyone not believe everything should blink? Oh, oh, one guy. One guy doesn't want things to blink. Um, you can report to the Office of Not Blinking Things later, sir. But I believe, like Dale Doherty, who coined the, coined the term make, that everyone is a maker, because I told all of you, all of you are makers. It's not just a pile of parts or blinky things or a 3D printer. It is very simply what you have made. 
It's not whether what you made is any good. It's not, it doesn't matter if it's a pile of sand or the fantastic sand castle. And what I love about this one is it says anything once. And that's sort of my maker philosophy. I'll try to make anything once. It might go badly. I don't recommend making graham crackers, by the way. Marshmallows, yes. Graham crackers, no. It's simply that you have created. That's the important thing. So we as humans are makers. It is intrinsically part of our existence. But there's this path that many of us as individuals have taken that, model, that it mirrors our behavior as a species over the last many, many years. So we're going to go all the way back to the beginning of humans creating. So anthropologically speaking, a little history lesson for Sunday morning, because I like that all of you are so awake on Sunday morning. That's really fantastic, by the way. We largely recognize the beginning of humans, you folks, as the moment at which we started using tools. And while a few other species use tools, we are the only ones that use tools to create other tools. And so then we come up to the Stone Age, which we mark as when Fred Flintstone started the Whirligig. You're all awake. Yes, you're all awake. This is fantastic. No, the Stone Age is the arrival of stone tools, which is about two and a half, two and a half million years ago. And tools changed our existence because now you didn't have to actually come in physical contact with the thing that you wanted to kill and eat. You could hit it with a spear from 50 feet away and things were good. That meant independence. And that's important to the maker movement, that sense of independence from the things that we have made. Didn't take too long before we lost interest, not lost interest, but gained interest not only in the functional, but added interest in the aesthetic. We started making art, simply put. Uh, there's evidence of art creation as much as 100,000 years ago in the Paleolithic, Paleolithic area. And much like you guys, when you were five years old, it started with painting your hand on the wall. Uh, and this is Cueva de los Manos in Argentina. It's actually only about 10 or 12,000 years ago, but you smack your hand on the wall, you blow some pigment, you made a painting, congratulations. And it gets a little more advanced, better cave art, better paintings, we started sculpture. This is the Bradshaw paintings in Australia, the wonderwork engravings and paintings in Africa, the petroglyphs in Balsa Monica. We got better and better at this. And then we had metal tools. And then we had agriculture and machines and ever more complicated machines and ever more interesting things that did better tasks that then took us outside of Earth and up to the stars. And all of it because we're makers. And there's a little bit of a bittersweet choice in this picture. This is a picture I took uh, when I went to the launch of STS 135 four years ago, which was the final launch of the American shuttle mission. But what's important is not that that was an end, but that we went from this to this, all out of that innate spirit to create, and that thing that makes us human, that maker spirit. But in order for any of that to happen, we had to not only be makers. Is that me? Da -na 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 -na. Oh, good, we're back. Am I good? All right, so in order for any of that to happen, we had to not only be makers, but also be sharers. We had to be creatures who were willing to tell one another what we had learned, whether that was turning a stick into a spear or blowing pigment around your hand to make a hand painting on the wall. We had to share that information. And then somewhere along the way, way more recent than all of that, everybody got a little bit possessive. And the way I like to imagine this, these are my friends Og and Grog. And Og walks up to Grog and he goes, how you make hot pit? And Grog goes, mm, go get your own lightning. I also like to a little bit think that perhaps Og and Grog were good guys over the fire until it came down to how to make bacon. And that's when things turned ugly. <laughs> but let's hop back on our timeline and talk about something besides bacon. So we fast forward to 500 BC, and uh, this is uh, the remains of Sybaris in Greece. They basically invented patents on luxury. Because like me, these fabulous folks in Greece like food a lot. And so if you invented some wonderful delicacy, some fantastic cuisine, you got the rights to that thing for one year. You were the only person making that delicious thing in town. And in fact, they were so known for this obsession with luxury that now the word sybaritic uh, is a word for that opulent luxury and, and fantastic pleasure seeking. I like these folks and their food. I don't like the patent part, but I like the food. Uh, in the Roman Empire, the blacksmiths literally used trade marks, marks of their trade on their swords. They also arguably uh, had a precursor to the trade secret concept that was based around selling of slaves and what they might tell their next owner about what their previous owner had been doing. Then what we assume to be the first uh, copyright battle, so to speak, was, took a couple more hundred years. So St. Columba, uh, I kind of love this story, except for the ending, uh, he was an Irish Gaelic missionary and he studied, studied under this guy named St. Finian. Now Columba uh, didn't have access to Torrance or a Kindle, and so he spent a lot of time rewriting books by hand up until the day he died. And he would go to St. Finian's library, borrow a book off the shelf, painstakingly write it all down again for his own personal use, put the book back. This seems pretty reasonable as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Finian didn't think so. He declared it illegal copying, freaked out, and went to the king. 
and the king whose name I'm not going to attempt to pronounce because Gaelic, uh, I just call him King Copyright McCopyrighterson, ruled in Phineas, Finian's favor, saying famously, to every cow belongs its calf, to every book its copy. So essentially, every copy of a book belongs to the guy who owned the original book. And the sad ending to this is that it ended in something called the Battle of the Book, which killed 3,000 people because a guy wanted to read his own copy of a book. In less deadly IP news, unless they actually were using Cylons, uh, in 1266, the English Parliament required all of the bakers to mark their bread with, with the mark of their bakery. Uh, I, I also like beer and not only food. Uh, so conveniently, Lowenbrow has effectively the oldest trademark, going back to 1383. They've been using that same lion. Then patents were first genuinely in, uh, uh, granted in Venice, in Italy, for the glass makers. England caught on about five minutes later and uh, thought that patents were a great way to encourage innovation. And what actually happened was it encouraged monopolies and thus patent abuse was born about 10 minutes later and then 15 minutes later patent reform. It's a very speedy process. <laughs> Brings us up to 1710, the Statute of Anne in Great Britain was also the first real copyright act. England just plowing away at the intellectual property law. They came up with trade secret law, uh, sent it over to the US in the 1800s and that basically brings us up to today in a speedy, speedy zip through history that went from sharing in order to simply eat and survive to this exploding system of protection and, and well, this. But now, instead of all of that grand, broader picture thing, let's think about it on the scale of one person's life, in your life. When you were a kid, basically the first thing that somebody taught you was that you should share. And yet the adults teaching that lesson somehow seem to have forgotten it in the process. They want longer copyright terms and more patent protection and shrouds and secrecy and all of this and not sharing. So little Johnny, I need you to share your toys just as long as they're not my toys. No different from Og and Grog. Eventually we're both going to make fire and fire is going to launch us to the moon. But the path is so much shorter and so much better when Og just gives Grog some fire and bacon. Uh, likewise, Grog's going to share his discovery of how to sharpen a spear. We're going to have some broader roots dinner. It's going to be fantastic. So we've spent centuries now trying to squirrel away our secrets and, and hide our creations and make slides that functionally work. Uh, we, we invented the concept of luxury brands and this need for them. And in turn, then we've invented this culture of consuming and disposing, which if my slides work would be a fantastic picture of a landfill full of electronics. Sorry about that. But it's like we've created this culture of consuming and disposing the luxury instead of repairing and creating and rebuilding and making and sharing. So the maker movement is a slice of humanity that has said enough of all of that. People didn't just start creating and sharing again because somebody slapped the name maker on it. There have always been these crafters and creators and tinkerers. It was simply what you did. Uh, and in my parents' generation and before that, you didn't throw away the thing and buy a new one. You fixed it. You fixed the thing. You made your clothes. You fixed your television if it broke. Because, but it was because you could. There were parts available and that was an option. Your things were accessible to you. Then we started closing up things until we arrived at this, which I imagine is in many of your pockets. Uh, it's this seemingly ubiquitous device that you can do almost nothing that you want to. And I don't mean this as an iPhone hater, which I a little bit am. It's just an excellent example of this culture that we've created. So for those of you about my age, try imagining telling your parents in the 70s or 80s that there's this really expensive thing you need them to buy and you're going to use it every single day, but you can't actually change the battery yourself. Or, or anything useful to repair it. It's, it's going to be really hard. They would have told you you were insane. So this is a great book that I highly recommend uh, from O'Reilly called Vintage Tomorrows. And the observation in Vintage Tomorrows is that this whole maker culture sprung up about the same time as the steampunk culture. And they went, huh, that's interesting. Why is that? Uh, for those of you who might not be entirely familiar with steampunk, it's basically this uh, retro-futuristic idea in which technology, yes, but powered by steam, sort of neo-Victorian kind of thing. Steampunkers are frequently makers, huge crossover. Uh, and a lot of it grew out of uh, a community of people just like you. A lot of them actually are software people. And I, uh, what the conclusion in the book is, is that uh, we had reached this point where the things that we were making were virtual. It was a lot harder to say, look at this code that I wrote or this website that I made that requires me to have my internets and my laptop and all of the things and you can do this. Those are intangible creations. They're hard to share. And so we had reached this point where we desired showing the things that we had made. We wanted to make. We wanted to share. But we needed these tangible goods. 
And so the book describes the simultaneous arrival of makers and steampunk as a desire to return to that time when we owned our things, which is also what the make motto says. If you can't open it, you don't own it. It's not yours. And so it seems, yeah. It seems like in this motto that the maker movement would be open by default, intentionally sharing, sharing on purpose, creative derivative works, building on what everyone else has done. But the truth, I think, is actually the opposite and growing in the wrong direction. And that's what I want all of you to help change. Uh, there is a growing awareness in FOSS communities, I think, about the maker movement that wasn't there a few years ago. In fact, just at last year's LinuxCon, uh, two of the keynotes were the founder of the Open Prosthetics Project and uh, the VP of MakerBot, which we will get back to in a minute. So most of what follows, I want to mention, uh, is the open hardware projects and things that blink, because all of you but one guy like things that blink. Uh, which, I, but I don't want you to think that the, the non-tech, non-hardware-y things aren't important. They are. Uh, because no projects just appear out of thin air. They all come from the same fundamental place of, of I have a reason to create and then to share. But the open hardware stuff makes a really good example, and it's more familiar to all of you, and so that's why that's where we're starting. So since the maker movement makes you think of things with Blink and 3D printers, let's talk about the open hardware movement, which again, sounds open by default. It's right there in the name. They have a pretty little logo that looks a lot like the open source logo that we're familiar with. There's an open hardware definition, which this is a chunk of. It's hardware whose design is made publicly available so that anyone can study, modify, distribute, make, and sell the design or hardware based on that design. There's also a dedicated conference, the Open Hardware Summit, that's done by the Open Source Hardware Association that made the open hardware definition. How many times can I say open hardware in one sentence? Uh, I first attended the Open Hardware Summit in 2012, which I think was uh, their third year. I'd w watched it online until then and went in person. And I did it when I was writing for opensource.com. I thought, this is great. This is, this is the next step in open source. This is our future. There were uh, super awesome, awesome Sylvia was there. She was 11 years old at the time. She has a DIY maker show on YouTube that's really popular. There was a 77-year-old who had created a $150 late slash mill slash drill out of scrap metal. There was the guy who puts the, the little backpack on the cockroach to control the cockroach. I don't know if you've seen this, but it's, if nothing else, amusing. Uh, <laughs> And lots and lots of really interesting maker stuff. I was interested in all of these projects, and I thought there would be a significant connection to open source software. And then this is the headline I wrote afterwards. And that, Open Hardware Summit Open to Hybrid Models, was the optimistic and pleasant view of how I really felt about what had happened. Because what I saw there wasn't a culture of openness by default. It was one of openness by accident. It was people who shared because it was the internet age and I put my stuff on the internet and I showed it to you and I didn't think about a license or anything like that. I just wanted to show you what I made. You put some stuff you made online. So it wasn't without hope. It started with a keynote from Chris Anderson who was at the time uh, editor-in-chief of Wired and he said, Everything I've learned as I built my own business is because people shared what they knew. Yay! Right, no, shut up. Uh, the next sentence was, I don't think we should be dogmatic. We need to consider other possibilities and approaches to open innovation. And then he started talking about the limitations of open hardware and said that the only solution was alternatives. Maybe you have a conditional license with restrictions on commercial use, or you release only your schematics, or you have open software but closed hardware. And the truth is, all of that is exactly where the open hardware movement has gone. So the next interesting uh, talk of the day was Brie Pettis, who was the co-founder of MakerBot. And uh, the reason it was interesting that day was uh, because that was the week that MakerBot announced that the Replicator 2 would be closed. And then he got up on stage at the Open Hardware Summit to talk about why they had made that choice. He used to talk of openness, and I swear this is the most words I've ever put on the slide, but uh, if you want to take a second to like, speed read through. We have in 2011 where he talks about how people will remember that businesses that refuse to share with their customers and wonder how they could be so backwards. This is what every Brie Pettis interview sounded like. Openness was critical. It was not a choice. And then people started cloning the MakerBot, and they panicked and decided it was time to close it up. But despite that sealed up box, what we still have, the legacy of all of that, is more important than one printer. It's a community of thousands of designers and engineers who are still sharing designs and making 3D printing more accessible. Uh, most obviously through Thingiverse, which is a MakerBot-owned site, but also in hackerspaces around the world and on other websites, and simply by talking to one another. They're making it easier and easier every day. And in even better news, there are still plenty of companies that are working on doing it the open source way and doing it successfully. If you've come by the Fedora booth, you've seen a Lulzbot 3D printer in action. 
The latest interesting entrance into the possibilities here is Autodesk, and this is the Autodesk Ember, which isn't the 3D printer you're accustomed to seeing, like the, the lull spot of the Fedora booth where it lays down a layer of plastic and another layer of plastic and grows up. This one, uh, it's digital light processing, which projects liquid uh, light into liquid plastic, and then it rises, and so it kind of is made the other direction. And since that doesn't make a lot of sense, and because this is the most mesmerizing video in the world, we're going to take 10 seconds to watch how that works. I could watch this over and over and over. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Don't you kind of just want to watch it over and over? Uh, yeah, that's pretty awesome. Now, they have explicitly said they don't really intend this printer to be for consumers, which is good because it costs like $6,000. Uh, what they have done is looked at a market opportunity because analysts are saying that 3D printing is going to be a $16 billion market by 2018. And they recognize that right now, there's a bit of a failure rate in 3D printing. Uh, depending on the printer you have, somewhere between a 25% and a 75% failure rate. And they see an opportunity for making the world a better place, making the 3D printing world a better place. So. They are theoretically, at this point, uh, giving away the software to encourage hardware makers to do something about it. They intend to open the CAD designs and the material formulations, uh, and I like to lean towards optimism. So even though this isn't all a done deal yet, I believe, I believe in a future of goodness. All will be well. So to get back to the Open Hardware Summit, uh, about the same time, there, uh, I, was, I was getting the same stories from everyone there and, and from other people online working on Open Hardware. Again, they weren't being open on purpose. They were being open because that was just what they wanted to do. It was convenient. I wanted to show you this thing. They didn't know about Linux. They didn't know about open source software. There was nobody using Linux in that room. It was all Windows and Macs. And in a lot of cases, they were largely unaware that all of the problems they were discussing had been solved by the open source community 10 years ago. <laughs> about the same time, uh, several of the first open hardware summits were held right before Maker Faire New York, World Maker Faire New York, which uh, is the second biggest. The bigger one is in Bay Area. And so I started going to uh, the maker fairs, the local mini maker fairs, giving talks, presenting projects, just talking to people. They're designed to be the place where makers go to share their projects and get ideas for their next cool, awesome thing. Alas, over the last year or two, uh, I, uh, that's about when it started, I think, there's been this subtle but important change. This is uh, the, the descriptor they use for maker fair, the greatest show and tell on earth, except what it's actually become is the greatest show and sell on earth. At Bay Area Maker Faire last year, I, I went around to a lot of the booths and I did what I always do at Maker Faire. I would say, hey, is your stuff online? Do you use open hardware? Can you tell me more about that cool thing that you've made? I am interested in your project. And instead of answering those questions, mostly they said, I can sell you one. And the sponsors have changed too. It's not just the makers. The sponsors at Maker Faire have gone from things like the Radio Shack Learn to Solder booth, which is super cool, but you know, moment of silence. <laughs> This is SparkFun, also in this case doing a Learn to Solder booth. I love SparkFun. They put on super fun booths wherever they go. And as someone who helps run events, I understand the importance of sponsors. Thank you to all of the scale sponsors who have made it possible for us to be here. <laughs> Yay! But there's a difference in showing up at an event like a Maker Faire between let me teach you something useful on behalf of my company and the thing that almost single-handedly made me start thinking about all of this and write this talk, which apparently is so embarrassing I couldn't even find a picture of the booth and had to use the press release, and that was the Purina booth. I'm still a little fuzzy on cat food and makers. The, their, their connection to the makers was they would give you a piece of paper and you could cut out a paper cat toy, which I'm pretty sure is how you get your cat to eat paper. <laughs> so it's this title change, but I still think that there's time to change it. Because makers believe in innovation, and you can't innovate without sharing. You can't innovate by closing all of this up. And fundamentally, they believe in all of these same things that we believe in in open source software, in solving problems and sharing and doing it openly, and a greater result for everyone in the end. So now we're going to look at a few of the challenges that the makers face uh, that I think you'll generally recognize as quite similar to the problems we faced in software over the years with a few differences. So first, let's talk about the, the problem that people who don't understand how this open source thing works and that bothered Bree Pettis so much that they closed up the MakerBot. Clones. Somebody took my thing and made it a thing of their own, or they took Django Fett. No, my, my analogy is falling apart. 
So let's talk uh, about these pies. As you may have inferred by that whole book thing, I have something of an interest in the Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pi is unfortunately not 100% open, which is not a, a, a solitary story in the open hardware world because of that Broadcom SOC that isn't open. But it's close enough that it does serve as an excellent example for this purpose. Because as a result, I don't go to a conference where somebody doesn't ask, have you seen the apple, banana, orange, gooseberry, kiwi, starfruit pie? <laughs> I am pretty sure at this point, if there's a fruit name, someone has slapped pie on the end of it and made a board out of it. <laughs> Especially once the Raspberry Pi compute module came out, uh, plus there's this companion base board, there are gobs of similar boards, sometimes they're faster or more RAM or whatever. They're also usually more than the $35, which hello, that's a lot of the appeal because it's not, it's a super fast computer. Yes, John, and your minnow boards, we'll get back to you. <laughs> but is all of that damaging the Raspberry Pi in any way? Has anyone tried to buy a Raspberry Pi 2? Yeah? Yeah, how many of you have obtained your Raspberry Pi 2? Oh, you're doing a good job. But it was hard. Like, that site was down. It was not an easy task. Clearly, all of these other fruit pies are doing terrible, terrible damage to the Raspberry Pi market. Because a solid project with a solid plan and a solid community stands up. It works out. And if somebody makes an improvement on it, that means that something better has come out of your project. And if that bothers you, that means it's on you to keep innovating. That's how this all works. One area that would be happy for the success of being cloned uh, is the field of open source medical devices, particularly prosthetics. And it's one of those ways in which all of this maker stuff is not about blinky things and 3D printing a TARDIS, as cool as that is. The maker movement can have serious life-changing impact for people, and this is one of those examples. The Open Prosthetics Project is exactly what its name implies. They're working on building better prosthetics for people the open source way, and that means open hardware, open software, open firmware. Prosthetics are expensive. They're generally indi uh, individually designed. Uh, it's a small market, which makes it hard to attract venture capital. It's a really ripe field for open source to be solving their problems. Uh, and as a, uh, by the way, for those of you looking for how to attract more people to your project, this is their homepage, like smack in the middle of their homepage. They explain exactly how you can help, no matter who you are. Good example to follow. <laughs> this is one of my favorite stories from their site because it, it shows another excellent benefit of open source communities. Because what the maker movement is changing, uh, among other things, is accessibility to creation. And that's why these five 12 to 14 year olds were able to create a swimming prosthetic for a woman who had been born without a left arm. Because prototyping has become more affordable now, which means it's accessible, which means anyone, including a pack of 12 to 14 year olds, can, in this case, win the Oregon First Lego League Championship by creating a prosthetic and making someone's life that much better. But there are other types of medical devices, uh, which bring us to the next point on uh, how open hardware wins. Security in the hardware and in the software. And if you've ever heard Karen Sandler talk, uh, give her pacemaker talk, you have heard what I still, for many years, believe to be the single most compelling reason that open source is important. If you haven't heard it, I highly recommend finding one of her talks or papers online. Just Google open source pacemakers. You are well on your way. Uh, one third of the medical devices sold in the United States between 2005 and 2009 were recalled. Uh, multiple vu vulnerabilities have been found in devices that range from, say, sending 45 days worth of insulin in one shot to sending an 830 volt lethal shock to your pacemaker from 50 feet away. That's why openness is important. Uh, and it's certainly not a new problem. It's not even about cracking. Simply buggy code has been a problem. There were six deaths in the mid-1980s from a radiation therapy machine. There were several hundred people who died in the second half of just the last decade from drug infusion pumps that had buggy code, because generally this code is not even reviewed by anyone unless the manufacturer asks for it to be so. Openness for these devices and for everything else means audit, whether it's for the unintentional vulnerabilities or the intentional backdoors and spying. We've seen what happens with the DRM. We've seen Superfish this week. Over the last year, we're hearing more and more about the, the insecurity in networking and other hardware. Even the New York Times now, uh, and this was 2013, is calling for open hardware as the key to a more secure internet. And if you've been reading the New York Times for more than since 2013, that kind of sounds crazy. That that's what, even the New York Times has arrived at this conclusion. And so clearly, uh, it is time. 
So as an example of success, many of you have heard of the Novena, which is a great example of a project trying to fight this battle. It was created by the guys who created the Chumbi, which sadly is uh, no longer supported. It was a hack-friendly Linux-based alarm clock, still wakes me up every morning, because that's the magic of open source. Uh, it was designed with full, the Novena, not the Chumbi, well, the Chumbi as well, it was designed with full transparency in mind with an eye to security. Bunny, who previously found enjoyment writing Xbox hacks, uh, drew every trace on the PCBs himself. It's uh, not 100% open, which, is, as I said, is a recurring problem. There are bits they had to buy off the shelf. The, the screen, the battery is actually an RC car battery, which is kind of awesome. Uh, but it's about as close as you're going to get to a fully open laptop right now. As an aside, uh, Bunny and No Starch released his Hacking the Xbox book for free online as an ebook in honor of Aaron Swartz. And so even if Hacking the Xbox doesn't interest you in any way, what is really interesting is the letter that he wrote announcing that release. And uh, this is the link to that. And all my slides will be on later because there are more links in here and books that you should all read. So the next and perhaps most obvious challenge that's a little bit different from the for the open hardware community and the open source maker community is that of the different legal issues they face. And I am not a lawyer, but it is all too important to not bring up. Uh, because unlike software, which is protected by copyright as soon as you start typing, hardware has a whole host of other problems. Uh, first of all, and most significantly perhaps, there's licensing. And we in this room have at least some base understanding of what that means when it comes to code. And when it comes to hardware, copyright might still apply to your design files, but not to your object itself. And a patent may apply if that's the direction you want to go. It may, be, may not even be relevant. But largely, your open hardware tangible good is going to be a little bit short of protection, which in many cases is actually a really good thing and leads to better innovation. But there are two major licenses intended for hardware, the Taffer Open Hardware License and the CERN Open Hardware License. Uh, we don't have time here to go into the details of licensing because that's a whole other talk, but if you do want to read about it, I recommend uh, this paper written by Andrew Katz, which is about two years old but still relevant. All of this is a bit of a learning curve for the maker because I'm sure all of you who started writing code and had to learn about licenses, you remember what that was like. This is an even more complicated ball of wax to deal with. So some people instead choose simply to open and license the design files, not worry about the hardware itself. They, there, there are multiple options. It's a lot to sort out. But that doesn't mean that it's not important to sort it out. Uh, we need to solve these issues. And the legal arena is particularly hairy for the open prosthetics and the medical devices, because not only do they have to deal with the open hardware questions, but also all of the medical legal questions. Uh, and that's not even its own talk. It's a whole other conference. So moving past the legal, uh, fundamentally, regardless of any of those problems, it, it's important to remember that the reason we solve these problems is because much like what's left of the once open maker bot, you can always have a community. You can share with that community, engage with that community, and that's the important part. So where are we going to find this community? Since we need other people to work on our tangible goods with, and IRC is not really quite as useful for that, your local hacker space. Uh, this particular one is in Brussels. Now, there's a bit of a name debate over hackerspace, makerspace. I'm not going to say hackerspace slash makerspace every time I say it, so we're just going to go with hackerspace. And if that bothers you, you can mentally substitute whatever word you prefer. <laughs> you used to be able to tell me there's not one near me. That is decreasingly an excuse. And I wanted to put up a map, uh, hackerspaces.org. You can go and you can drill down to your location, but you used to be able to zoom out to the world and you could see like all of the little things everywhere. Except at this point, it's too many for them to display on the map at once. They're limited to the 500 most recent. So now they have 1,140 active hacker spaces listed and 350 more that they know of being planned. So no longer can most of you tell me, I don't have a hacker space. You just haven't found it yet. And if you legitimately don't have one, that means you have to go make one. I think the most interesting ones are the biohacker spaces. Uh, and I, I know there's at least one of those in LA. They make uh, the, the bio-research more accessible, which I think is really fascinating. It means that you can have access to a PCR machine or a DNA isolator, or a centrifuge or incubator or a microscope or industrial fridges and freezers and all of this stuff without having to go into academia and deal with all of that. And I find that really appealing. Uh, there also is some, some real change happening in other hacker spaces. This is uh, the Tokyo hacker space after the Fukushima disaster, hooked up Geiger counters to the internet and released the results all as open data uh, so that everyone could see accurate radiation readings and stream the data. This is uh, an Intel Science Fair Award winner named Jack. Uh, Jack created a test for pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer during their early stages which again is a really great example of how this is no longer about people who have degrees and things, it's about this kid. But the example that I really want to make out of him here is why you should send your kids to the hacker space, even if you're not willing to go. 
because the person I love here, as wonderful as Jack is, is really his mother. Because Jack has many interests, and his school made him take his homemade arc furnace back home. To which his mother simply said, don't burn down the house or kill yourself or your brother. I don't know about, enough about physics and math to know if that's a death ray or not. <laughs> and that is the mother I would like all of you to be to your children. Just say, don't kill anybody or burn down the house. Go off and make something cool. That's what this is all about. So if you've heard me give a talk before, you know I like to send you home with a reading list. We have Vintage Tomorrows. The next on our reading list is the Maker Movement Manifesto. It was written by Tech Shop CEO Mark Hatch. He didn't found Tech Shop, but he's been at the head of it since about 2007. Tech Shop is a chain of maker spaces in an assortment of places. Uh, Mark Hatch has a pretty bold vision for what Tech Shop should be. He believes that they have the unique opportunity to arm the maker movement army with the tools it needs to change itself and the world. That's bold, but he backs it up with stories. So many stories that after a while it starts to feel repetitive, but I kept reading the whole thing because they were all really great. A lot of companies have come out of tech shops. Tech Shop Hatch Square and the Dodo case, uh, both of these are really great stories of how, how failing quickly leads to faster innovation, leads to more success in your business. This book is story after story like this of people who have no background in engineering and no idea what they're doing, making a successful product and a business out of it. My absolute favorite story in this book is about a guy named Mike. So uh, Hatch says that he likes to walk around the floor, ask people what they're working on. He runs into this middle-aged guy who's working on what he describes as a poorly constructed, clunky, aluminum block-like structure, which if this were a Marvel movie would turn out to be an affinity gem. But no, he says it's a desktop diamond manufacturing device, like I'm sure all of you have on your desktops, right? Yes. <laughs> And Hatch says, I decided he might be a little bit crazy when he said all that there's left to do is rip the magnetron out of a microwave so I get the plasma ball I need. <laughs> now, Mike sounds completely insane, right? Well, it turns out Mike is actually a physicist who worked at a diamond deposition tool company, and he knows exactly what he needs to be doing. And his goal is to make a diamond ring for his wife. Not like a ring with a diamond on it, like a ring made of diamond. But what's important about Mike's story is it matters, yeah, I know, don't you want one? It matters absolutely not at all whether Mike was ever successful in making his diamond ring. What's important is that he told Hatch that based on his industry exper experience, and to even have attempted this before would have cost him $80,000. With Tech Shop and the tools that it provided, it cost him $1,000 to try to figure out how to make a diamond ring. That is a literally industry-changing factor of cost. Uh, other stories about Tech Shop talk about how things that used to take months or years took a week or three weeks. That is huge. When you've gone from your life savings and your quarterly bonus uh, to a week, that's the sort of change that can completely move around how R&D and manufacturing and the entire way we know tangible goods come into existence work. And the openness and sharing of that process are critical to making it happen. It all happened because people were sharing with each other in a hacker space. So what comes next in the hacker space? All these people are ready to create their businesses. Now they want to make money, because when one project does it, everybody else decides it's time to make money. Money is good. It's okay. We all need to live. I don't blame this. This whole making stuff hobby, it is expensive. Just ask my husband. <laughs> and so that's why a lot of them turn to crowdfunding, because of this, because these are some of the highest funding crowd projects in history, which uh, are all arguably maker projects in some fashion. I'll even call the card game a maker project. These all made more than the Veronica Mars movie made. <laughs> I would like $10,000. Here you go, have almost $9 million. That's a really appealing proposition for people who have something to sell. And so you're probably familiar with the idea of crowdfunding through Kickstarter, Indiegogo. <laughs> yes, we'll take a moment to, to gaze upon Beer 2D2. <laughs> kind of want one, don't you? Uh, so crowdfunding is a really popular choice for maker-driven projects looking for a market. And one of my favorite circular ones here, this is a screenshot from a movie called Maker, which is about the maker economy, which had a Kickstarter project because it's a maker project. And then, yeah, they raised $30,000 and they asked for $15,000. It was another really successful project. Crowdfunding is great because not only do you get the money out of it, but it lets you build a customer base. You get an early proof of concept. You get to market your idea. It also forces you to do some realistic research and planning about exactly what was going on in your head because writing on a napkin at the bar is not actually a business plan. 
crowdfunding is also a little bit deceptive in that people tend to think it's so much easier than the old way. It is. It is in many ways, but it is also not a one-click mail your stickers and t-shirts path to riches. <laughs> It, this is worth keeping in mind as well when you are backing projects because Kickstarter is not a shopping mall. It's more like you are a renaissance patron of the arts. You are putting your money behind something that you believe in, and in exchange you may get something back. You may not. That's how this works. This is support for things that deserve support that aren't going to get it in any other way. This is a way for us all to bring into existence things that we think are deserving. And uh, that's a highly suitable metaphor for makers learn looking to turn their art into money. Crowdfunding has spread way beyond Kickstarter. There are so many crowdfunding platforms now. I started to put them on a slide and I just gave up because there are too many. Uh, Kickstarter has the all or nothing funding mo model. A lot of the trend now is towards you actually get to keep what you raise even if you don't meet your stated goal. Uh, there are things like Bounty Source, which offers a bounty when a problem is solved. In the, that case, it's uh, GitHub issues. There are crowdfunding sites for equity now in which instead of a t-shirt or a sticker or the thing that they're making, uh, you get equity in the resulting company. And so some people see crowdfunding as a threat to venture capital. It's not a one or other kind of deal. Very rarely is the world black or white. In fact, the smart venture capitalists are taking advantage of the new model. Uh, and so 10% of crowdfunded projects that pass the $100,000 mark end up with venture capital in the end. The VC is looking at successful campaigns to figure out where it's time to move in. Uh, and that's because crowdfunding comes with a lot of benefits beyond the money, not the least of which is, again, slides that go blank. Uh, you, get, you get access to user-centric design. You're forced into it because you are putting your stuff out there before you're putting it on the shelf. The customers get involved early in your process. Uh, you can get information simply as simple as what the most popular color is. I backed a laser cutter on uh, Kickstarter, and one of the benefits was I got to pick if I wanted red or blue. I picked red. <laughs> or you get the very basic fact of how many people are even interested in what you have to make. It's so effective as a market test arena that Sony is on its third Kickstarter project, and it's not because nobody bought a PS4. They were looking for $50,000 on, oh, this is really interesting. So I took this screenshot last night. They're looking for $50,000 on Indiegogo. I checked again this morning just in case it had gone over the line because they were really close. It's actually down to 41000 this morning. That's interesting. Uh, but, but Sony, even Sony is using crowdfunding for market research now. There's a crowdfunding professional association now, which is good because all of these money-making good times are not without pitfalls. Crowdfunding is not a magical solution to turn the idea you had in the bar last night into your retirement plan you do have things to think about. Uh, it's crazy but true, but you are somewhat obligated to fulfill your promises. Not everybody manages to do that, but that's kind of the way it's supposed to work. Success even can be a problem. This is uh, 2012, I think, Order of the Stick, which is a webcomic, launched a Kickstarter campaign to put out a hard copy version. And they asked for $57,000 to print copies. They got 1.2 million, and the printer said, we don't have that kind of capacity. You, you, 110,000 copies, no, we can't, we can't do that. They did eventually fulfill it, uh, but success was a problem. About, about the same time, the printer bot, which is another 3D printer, launched its first Kickstarter campaign to raise some money. They asked for 25,000. They got 800,000 and immediately a bill from the IRS for 330,000. <laughs> and that is not an isolated story. There is planning involved. You cannot just throw up your project and hope good times happen. But it, it, Kickstarter is getting better at explaining to makers what they need to do, what they can expect. Uh, Pebble is a good example of one that has responded to this well and built a really successful company out of it. How many of you are, are wearing Pebbles? I've seen a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. So that's more than a few in the room. Second challenge is that uh, in your head, you think that you're selling this to the whole world on the internet. In reality, this is an act of burying yourself naked before the people you care about and asking for their money. Because crowdfunded projects make money from an expanding circle of people. This starts with your mom and ends up with those faraway strangers that you thought you were actually going to sell to. Uh, possibly some guy on Reddit. Related, you don't get to just post your project and magically reap rewards. You actually need a well thought out plan because terrible write-ups don't get funded. At this point, they don't even get to make it onto the sites. Kickstarter actually accepts only about 60% of the proposals they get, and then about 40% of those actually reach their funding goals. It's not a magical solution, but it is a really good one for the makers. Uh, and you need a marketing plan in the end because nobody is going to magically find your project. And I mean that to be encouraging, all of this, not a deterrent, because crowdfunding, while it has critics and well-deserved criticisms, is rooted in the same open source philosophy. It is ostensibly a meritocracy in which the deserving projects are the ones that receive the support of the people who are willing to offer the support. 
OpenDesk is a project that connects designers and makers, specifically at this point in re regards to furniture creation. Uh, and so this is a good example of a non-blinky 3D printing thing. They've seen a good bit of success with using a hybrid model of crowdfunding and other means. And so they're crowdfunding in return for investment in the company. They're offering an equity stake, but they also have a grant from the UK Technology Strategy Board and money from an accelerator. And uh, they have some really awesome designs on the site if you happen to be a furniture building sort. As another example, Navina, which we've already talked about, and this is Sean Cross, the, uh, the other half of Navina. I think I only mentioned Bunny earlier. It started as a hobby project, which is how many maker projects start out. Very few of them start out as, I should make some money on that Kickstarter I've heard about. Let's make stuff. No, they start out as, I have a problem I would like to solve, and then I would like to sell it to other people to solve their problems. Uh, so when Navina reached that, problem, pro that point, uh, they had heard enough interest from other people. They launched a crowdfunding campaign. It was incredibly successful, a very good example of, well, that worked out. So we're wrapping up here on a good note. Makers who are open and successful, who create ecosystems and improve people's lives, like with better prosthetics or with more secure laptops, these are the types of makers that we want to encourage. The ones that we want to be setting the example for the success of open source and maker communities, and as a result, the success of maker community projects for the greater good. So let's wrap up to going back to why all of this matters. As believers in the importance of open source software, it can be a little easy for us to forget why openness is important, because we all simply know that it is. So why does it matter if all of these makers share what they create? So this is today's maker, maker friend Joe. Today's maker is the inventor of tomorrow's device. It might be a toy, it might be an article of clothing, or it might be life-changing or life-saving even in the case of those medical devices. So then the recipient of that creation now has the option to repair it, to make it better, to change it to something more suited to her specific needs, to even simply replace the batteries. And once she's done that, she's become the next maker, and it becomes a cycle, and maybe she'll make an even better version. Closing up this process at any point breaks that cycle of innovation. And as I've said, makers are at heart innovators. And so all of this cycle is important to continuing the innovation. So I've told you about some successes in that cycle. I've told you about some failures. I didn't always offer solutions, and that's because you're the solution. The solutions haven't all been found. Each of you has a different set of skills and strengths, and you have friends who have different sets of skills and strengths. So while most of you might be makers of code, you have friends who are writers and designers and lawyers and people who are good with hardware and not just software. And so what you have to do is use your experience in open source and why that's important and why it's successful to tell those people that they can help too. Because now you know the power of the maker and you already knew the power of open source and now you know the importance of creating and making to what we are as humans and to our future. So it's up to you, it's up to us, the open source community, who have seen for far more years than the open hardware and the maker communities have the importance of openness and how much more successful it is than the alternative to become a part of these communities and to lead in the maker communities and to share with them what we've learned. Because you all believe in openness and now you all believe in makers. So go forth and make things better. Thanks. All of you leaving are going to be really sad when I give away this minute board. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going in line for my book signing, right? That's why you're all leaving? Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's see. We have to figure out how to give this thing away. Microphone stuck in my ear. I'm just going to turn it off. <laughs> Yes, yes. How many of you are here for, for Week of Geek last night? Yay! Okay, so you know what full body rock, paper, scissors looks like. I'm, I'm going to need a representative from each side of the room. Any volunteers? All right, there's one. There's one. All right, you two. Come here. Did you both see what full body rock, paper, scissors looks like? Is, is Josh here? Josh Burkus, please demonstrate. Yeah. No, no. There is no lizard this time. It is simply rock. Okay, so you've got it. Show us rock, rock, paper, 
scissors. All right, so it's on go. I say one, two, three, go, and you do the thing. You ready? One, two, three, go. Okay? One, two, three, go. Are you guys clones? Do you have some sort of armor? Some. I was looking for stormtrooper armor last night, and no one was here. Okay, back to back. One, two, three, go. One, two, three, go. All right, rock, paper, paper covers rock. So this side of the room, all right, you, pick a number from one to nine. Yeah. Five. So fifth row, and 13th person since the scale, 13, five, six, seven, eight, 10, 11. There aren't 13 people in that row. Hey, guy in the green shirt. Yay, you would have been a boy. Oh, you're both wearing green shirts. Okay, so you guys have to do rock, paper, scissors now since you're both wearing green. Well, so you're both wearing green and you were like front and back, so now you have to go. All right, one, two, three. Did you see what happens? You got how this works? Back to back. We're going to be here all day. One, two, three, go. Paper covers rock. Congratulations. Oh, and, and wait, 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 I just want this. This was generously donated by minnowboard.org, whom you can visit in booth 64. So thank you all for coming. You can legitimately leave now. What's the name of your book? Raspberry Pi Hack. All right, so Ruth will be downstairs in what, 30 minutes? No, now. Now, right now, at the O'Reilly booth, I assume, uh, signing her Raspberry Pi Hacks book. Uh, so a quick reminder, sessions all day today, but our expo floor closes at 2. Have fun, everyone. <laughs>